Welcome back to DXP. Today, still on the subject of veganism, to see if you might be tempted to ditch the burger for the beetroot. I'm not sure if our next guest would do that. Let's find out who he is. He is known as the commander in beef at Carly Store. Please welcome to the show, Daniel Wainis. Daniel, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I was just stalking your Instagram and I was watching this very, very delicious video of you, I think, braising a rabbit. Gosh, the vegans are clutching their pearls right now. I'm a rabbit Syn owner. Synthetic, <laughs> synthetic pearls. Uh, not many, today, Peter. <laughs> how many times have I said that I want to cook your rabbits? <laughs> anyway, coming back to our question. Um, what is your take on veganism and the whole plant-based diet? I think there are, th there are three arguments. I, thought a lot, I think a lot of vegans are well-meaning people. Uh, I think there are three reasons why people become vegans. Um, there's a health argument, there's a sustainability angle, and then there's an ethical angle. I think all three, like for example, the rabbit that you just mentioned, um, you know, if, if you're eating any wheat products or corn products or anything like that, those products, especially in monocropping, at least four such animals are killed per acre, right? For, to have your ear of corn or to have anything. And then in industrial, again, this is industrial farming, Right? You, they come through with uh, Monsanto industrial pesticides, fertilizers, and just wipe out entire fields. So I think it's important to get the full picture from both sides. Why we're doing it, if we are becoming more plant-based, um, why we're doing it, and then understand both arguments and be open-minded, mm. right? In terms of whatever angle you're taking, be willing to consider that maybe you're not 100% right. I mean, uh, we were talking about the health benefits mm. of ditching the meat, going for more yep. plant-based diets. Would you at least agree that it might be a good idea to reduce the amount of meat we're intaking? No, I think we should increase it. So we actually consumed more meat in 1970s than we do today. Yet we had one, heart, one third of the heart disease, right? The problem isn't the meat, the problem is the processed foods. Like when we actually come down, take out the lobbies and say, hey, we need to stop eating packaged foods. I mean, what are you gonna take this uh, Beyond Burger or whatever fake burger that's plant-based with 22 different ingredients that coming from 22 different factories that are not even whole ingredients. You know, what is methyl cellulose? What is, what is expeller pressed, whatever, the two different seed oils? All of this stuff that, that we're saying is plant-based. And I agree that it's not fair to say that because plant-based can be healthy, right? You, you can go, especially I love Lebanese food, right? And most of the, uh, um, the starters at a Lebanese restaurant are, are plant-based, a lot of them vegan, and I love them. They're great and they're healthy and they're made out of whole foods. However, there is a lot of, of uh, blanket statements made out there that's like, no, meat is bad. No, veganism is bad. It's like, what's really bad? What's really destroying our health? It's processed food. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Okay, so I'm going to counteract that. And Go, the <laughs> There was a massive conference held in 2021. Okay, and I understand processed foods, but this actually went head and head with animal protein and plant-based protein. And I'm not talking about processed stuff. I'm not talking about the beyond the impossible. I'm talking about tofu, tempeh, chickpeas, beans, whatever it may be. And I know it is, it's very kind of clicky to say, oh, well, look at the Beyond Burger. It has safflower, it has processed stuff. But then let's also break down the red meat. Mm. And the two most studied things for the past 100 years have always been cardiovascular health and diabetes, two which have drastically increased. And the one thing that stems from this is saturated fat. We know that saturated fat is super high within red meat, right? Now, we know, and 2021 just came up with one of the biggest studies that says that if we reduce it, no one's saying eliminating it, if we just slightly reduce it to what they're kind of saying, to 100 grams a week or 500 grams a week, if your genetics allow for it, then it's fine to include it. But going carnivore to having 16 eggs a day and then a steak three, four times a week. I think from seven. the clinical studies have shown that. You think steak seven times a week? 100%, I do it seven times a week. My, uh, my, my, my blood sugar, my blood pressure, my triglycerides. You can, you can go down the list of things, of health things. And the, 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 the agenda against saturated fat, I don't understand it because it was never there before Ansel Keys in the 50s and before we had subsidized crops and everything, people ate lots of So meat. saturated fat actually came in in the 1920s when, when scurvy actually, they started kind of dealing with scurvy, saturated fat actually came in there. Saturated fat 
we've been eating for 200,000 years since we evolved. Yeah, but yeah. think about this. If yeah. we want to go back to our ancestors, yeah. or if we go to Neanderthal age, yeah. okay? Number one, there wasn't even that amount of animals even available at that time. And think about it, it was shared in a village. So let's just say a cow was slaughtered during some kind of festival. Okay. That cow was probably shared amongst the village. Love it. So you probably got this amount. No, we're not sitting here with So what was the rest of your diet? This is before, keep in mind, this is before farming. It was foraging. So kale didn't exist. It was only fruit and meat, right? Well, I would say foraging more, there was also herbs. There were some greens. They were definitely that. Make up your calories, make up your calories and get your essential amino acids, all nine essential amino acids, right? Plants you didn't also have, have you, all nine essential amino where acids. Where B12? Which plant has B12? So B12 actually doesn't come from an animal, it comes from the soil. Yes. When you go back to B12, right. it's what is the soil. That's so, why it, it becomes important what crops are being bought. So something edible for us. Give me one thing that's edible for us that has B12. Give me something that's edible in animal meat that has B12. What are you talking about? No, steak, no. steak has B12. Okay, uh, so what B12, B12 form is it? B in B12 and it's most avail bioavailable no, because, of the grass, because of the grass that they eat. And, and the chicory that comes from the root. Okay, but I'm asking you what form, because there's cyanobethanol, there's methobenominol, so which one is actually in beef that's actually there? I don't know which type, there we but go. it's the so bioavailable. This is what I'm well, trying to but say. I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you which type is not is available vegan. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a pill. So, if so you, then, okay, okay yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you this question. Mm -hmm. In 2020, when they, they did a whole study Who? on Who's the B12, so we've got the top scientists from American top, Heart who Association. Funded it? It doesn't, it, the funding isn't even there. Industry funding? And this is where I think conspiracy theory comes in. Because yeah. if you actually go to these medical conferences, uh -huh. these scientists and doctors are absolutely phenomenal. And they actually want to try and help. When the people are kind of saying big pharma is against us or whatever it is, it's not so much big pharma or the medication, it's how it's being abused in the population. Big, I will say, big farming. I will say that the conversation has gone a little bit beyond the layman's like us. <laughs> uh, so we can say that one other time. But yeah. I do want to talk about, uh, because you mentioned early on yeah. uh, that, uh, you know, when they're farming these industrial fields, that animals are being killed in this process. Yeah. But there's also the argument to be made that uh, if we eat more meat, we need more animals. They need more plants to eat as well. So, and you know, the methane, what, what would you say on the sustainability aspect when it comes to more animals, more meat? Is it harmful? I'm, I'm going to leave you, I'm going to leave you with some, some stuff because I don't know how much time we have. The, the uh, uh, sustainability, it's, it's all overblown, the GHG emissions. The only, this is why I ask about where a study is funded because actual government studies that are not funded by industry, like the EPA, Environmental Protection in, uh, Agency, right? They put animal GHG emissions at 3.9%. And that's actually accurate because you cannot put the transportation of the animal products on them. That's on transportation. So when you look at it from a cradle to grave analysis kind of way, it's, it's actually way overblown. But other than the sustainability element, uh, um, element, I am not for all kind of animal uh, cultivation, production, husbandry. We are for definitely ethical raising of animals, right? And then a regenerative form of farming. So monocropping which is when you're flying up in the air and you see all of these, you know, squares and circles of whatever, they're doing corn here, they're doing uh, grain here, they're doing, it's terrible. It's terrible for our soil. It's killing our soil, right? And when you have a regenerative farm, which is that your ruminants come, or the animals with multiple stomachs that are able to fertilize the soil naturally, and they move on from there, and then you plant a crop there, that crop grows much richer. And then you have what's called carbon sequestration, soil carbon sequestration. So the grasslands grow back richer and they sequester the carbon from the atmosphere. That's why I'm, uh, uh, I really recommend grass-fed beef because grass-fed beef is sustainable. It is 100% carbon neutral. Dan, I would love to see you and Faye on a podcast together. <laughs> Unfortunately, we don't have that much time. It's been a pleasure having you on. We'll share a steak. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Commander in Beef, thank you so much. Thanks for, for having me. On the show.